Welcome back, everyone. I hope you're doing great. Today, we get to check in with Overwatch, which, hey, is always a spicy time. They want you to pay 25 bucks for a single hero skin, but they've got a bit of a problem. They need ways to convince people to stay, to come back to the game, because if there's not any people, then who the hell is going to buy those skins? And they're trying to fix this by actually doing a fairly large sweep of changes to the game. They are doing a big change around Mythic skins and... Oh yes, this has come along with another consumption opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got another currency. Don't know about you, but I am just vibrating with excitement over uh, over the prospect. It's more than just that though. We've had a bunch of staff. Those staff have leaked to the press. If you want to know a little bit more about PvE missions and also basically why Blizzard seems to really struggle getting anything done, then I think you're going to find today's video to be really interesting. I absolutely loved just going through this, uh, this report that my team produced before doing today's video. Man, it is absolutely sick. Okay, so let's get into it. And this is powered by our wonderful members over at Bellular.Games. Over there, that's where we ditch Patreon. We went open source, doing our own thing. It's way better. Over there, you get all of our videos early. You get them ad-free. You get Loading Screen, which we publish every single day. And there's a great community, or members Discord, where everyone's uh, just hanging out, having the crack. And to be real with you, well, you know, this year has been a little bit rough. We've actually had uh, more sponsor cancellations than usual. So suffice to say, it uh, really does make an impact. And the whole team is extremely grateful to you all. Okay, let's go. Overwatch is changing, and it started with this uh, this director's update from Aaron Keller. They they kind of tried to do one of those like little candid, funny meme things at the start. Um, I'm not really that sure if it worked, but anyway, anyway. So they did that, and Aaron went through a bunch of changes. They're in three big categories: hero unlocks, mythic skin unlocks, and new map stuff. On the topic of heroes, you no longer have to unlock them. You don't have to wait for them. You'll just be able to play them. So. So going forward from season 10, all heroes, including uh, Venture, which is the new one, they will be unlocked for everybody and new additions. They'll just be there when the season comes out and you can play those characters. This is, I think, a very good thing. It's one of those challenging situations with Overwatch 2 where they were really trying to just pull as many monetization levers as they could. Their big thought was that if they could give you an instant unlock of the new hero with the battle pass, that that would be, uh, I suppose, a compelling purchase opportunity. And like, they did have other justifications for it. I don't really think they held that much water. Um, there, there was also a roundtable uh, interview with Games Radar, and uh, they basically said that they wanted to avoid, like, like having game imbalance because heroes are basically behind that paywall. The quote is, not all of those things we tried were as effective as we wanted them to be. I don't even think it's about any of this, right? It's clearly just about a money thing. And I think they, I think they're just finding that a new season is less exciting for people if they can't just log in and play the new hero. Ultimately, that kind of thing is damaging to the game. The next thing though is mythic skins. They're no longer going to be on the battle pass, but they will be coming out on a seasonal basis. They'll be in their own mythic section of the store where you, dear player, can spend Mythic Prisms. Now, these Mythic Prisms are earned on the Battle Pass. So, you progress the Battle Pass, and then you can get whatever, like, Mythic skin via that that you want. And look, I do actually think this is a fairly good thing. There's still a Mythic skin every season, but you can actually just buy the one that you want. That being said, there are, uh, there are a few terms and conditions that do apply here. So, once a new season starts, the previous skin will rotate off the shop, and it will be gone for two seasons uh, to ensure sure that there is still a level of prestige some other people would say so that there is a degree of the fear of missing out it's pretty much saying uh hey um if, if you don't finish that hero skin unlock uh sorry boy it's it's gonna take you a while so that was fairly interesting i mean we need to see how the particulars of this are implemented but the other thing here that is uh, fairly major to me is this is a new currency and they actually did say to gamespot that these mythic prisms will be something that you can buy in the store which is uh always what we love to see now per aaron keller the best way to get them is actually the battle pass so uh, i suppose that is good but uh yeah still the idea that they are purchasable that just brings up a lot of stuff i mean what if you like the current mythic skin but you know life's giving you some lemons uh, you know and this season's about to end so you can either go and you can purchase some more mythic prisms or you could purchase tier skips or maybe even you could go for a combination buy some tier skips to get a few more prism unlocks via the pass and then top yourself off with a nice prism bundle on the store 
That, folks, is what I call gaming. That's what I got into as a kid when I decided this would be a hobby that I would do. The next thing, then, is a shift in the development pattern for the game. This is one of those things, to be honest, it, it immediately does sound kind of de-hype, but it's probably good for health. So to explain, they have the intent of going for a sort of heartbeat model for the game with significant updates like Season 9's competitive rework being a thing, but the core improvements just being ongoing development. And in particular, this will impact maps. Season 11 is getting a new map, and uh, there are play tests for another in Season 10 alongside a new Clash mode, but these will be coming alongside further updates and reworks to existing maps that people basically want to see changes in. Cal Keller basically said that a season with no new map is a benefit because that means you can do a bunch of reworks to older maps and that sort of thing. To be honest, I actually completely agree with that. I mean, how many times when playing games have we just got, you know, new maps, new maps, new maps? It doesn't really like move the needle or the new maps maybe don't really live up to the hype. Um, I think with a lot of games, like even say CSGO, I mean, they're glacial when it comes to maps, but the amount of just like reworks uh, you know, the tweaks to maps. I don't know. I just think that's probably better for the health of the game. And ultimately, health of the game is the thing to talk about. They are, I think, culturally losing out, but uh, they do claim they'll be hitting 100 million players next season. Uh, but again, that's a very large number. That being said, it's also a free-to-play game, so it's very easy for something to increment that number up. Now then, to move on, another one of the things about Overwatch 2 that was a pretty major disappointment initially was how you got the actual premium coins. So the complete opposite of this is a game like Helldivers 2, where if you're just playing a shitload of Helldivers, like, you will get enough premium currency to actually meaningfully buy stuff, including the war bonds. Uh, Chris Holt at Forbes uh, seems to have um, just got some interviews, and they detailed a little bit more about how the cosmetic coin stuff works. Basically, those uh, premium like Overwatch coins, they're being taken away from the weekly challenges, and they're being put on the free battle pass, which does make a lot of sense, but when you actually get into it, it it's kind of funny to me. So, here's the quote. The battle pass is getting better in yet another way starting in Season 10. You'll earn coins in both the free and premium tracks the number of coins you will earn for free each season is also going up. Okay, just calm down, take a breath. This is going to be a really, you know, I don't want this to shock you. We're moving from 540 coins to 600 coins. I mean, that is 60 more coins. This is basically Overwatch 3. I am stunned. I am shook. I mean, it's better. It's better, man, but really? Um, what it does mean, though, is that this is moving off the weekly challenges. Those weekly challenges will now give people uh, Battle Pass XP. So, I suppose this is better than maybe you half completing a weekly. Um, they mentioned that this will be more flexible for people's playstyle. I definitely agree that it would be. Um, I mean, me as a player, like, the way that I play a lot of games, I am Turbo Degenerate Goblin for, like, three days. And then I just completely am doing something else for like two weeks. So uh, yeah, something like this actually would make a lot of sense for somebody like me. Now then, what this does mean is more coins. It means that they're on the pass. That's better. And uh, I suppose it is still like Diablo where you're not getting enough on the pass to buy the next pass. GameSpot are reporting that every two seasons, you'll be able to earn enough to purchase a premium battle pass, which uh, yeah, I mean, 600 times two, that is in fact over a thousand big thing. Okay, a lot of this stuff straight up is actually good for the health of Overwatch 2, right? Uh, no grinding or purchasable gameplay stuff by heroes. I think we can all support that. Um, the currency stuff is broadly uh, better. I think the battle pass is better. This is all progress, but again, but again, I mean, this is all very late, isn't it? Like, I do feel like we could have came to a lot of these positions more like uh, season two or season three, maybe even uh, season one, right? If they just had a bit more time or decided like, okay, we've got our launch version and it's definitely, you know, the, the greed has turned up to 11. I mean, how about you even take a little bit of a lesson from even the gacha game genre and try being generous first to get people in. But anyway, it's also a bit of a continuation of the theme where they, they try new stuff and then they basically trial and error their way back to a lot of past decisions. You know, we, we saw this tweet go viral and uh, I suppose a little bit of a big mood uh, along with it. The other side then is retention. It it's monetization, uh, you know, um, ultimately all of these good things. These are sweeteners being put into a rather bitter drink, right? This is the sugar to make the medicine go down because fundamentally this is still Overwatch 2. And 
if they implement those premium, uh, like the mythic prisms, if that is implemented in a kind of rough way, that could feel bad to people. It could rub off the wrong way. Now, what certainly is going to be rubbing off the wrong way is a little bit of that cowboy beatbop. So, do you have $25 worth of Overwatch coins? Do you have $50 worth of Overwatch coins? Because here's the deal. You could get, right? You could get three missions. With the Overwatch Invasion Pack for 15 bucks, that's gameplay. Or you could get a $25 uh, dollar skins. You get $25 skins with your cowboy beep bop. Woohoo. Um, yeah. Now there is, of course, a bundle that's 50 bucks. That is, in fact, folks, a 200% value. I mean, holy crap. Now, as people are pointing out, you could just buy Helldivers 2 pretty much. I mean, you're getting close to it. And uh, while playing Helldivers 2, you'll earn enough of that game's premium currency, probably, to not, uh, you know, to not really have to go crazy in future purchases there. You could buy our video game, The Pill Beyond. Look! I'm even wearing the team hoodie. You could buy that. You could buy multiple copies of the Pale Beyond, um, which, you know, took us years to make. <laughs> you could do that. You could do literally anything else. Now, obviously, when you're dealing with these brand collabs, there's always going to be, uh, you know, it'll always be more expensive because some of that money has got to go to the Cowboy Bebop people. What is hilarious, though, is you could also buy uh, Cowboy Bebop, the complete series on Blu-ray for $25.97. It could be yours. Maybe you could even uh, rip your Blu-rays and put them onto your Plex server or something. Uh, okay, I mean, what's actually going on here is they are going for the higher price. Uh, it's, it's basically a psychological thing called price anchoring, right? You put a, uh, you know, you put up a big price and then you, you know, a big price that's like more than you actually think somebody would pay. That's the $25. But then you present them with a deal and that deal is framed in terms of your inflated price anchoring uh, value, right? So is one of these skins worth $25? when there are four skins and you can buy all of those skins for $50. $25 is basically a trap, right? It's a total trap. The $25, $25 a skin exists to get people to buy $50 of skins. Because here's the thing, even if there's one skin that you actually want and you don't really care about the other ones, you're going to feel like a dipshit for not getting the right deal. This is monkey lizard brain. It's like, wh why pick one apple from this, uh, I don't know, tree that I'm climbing about as a monkey when there's three more over there and I can just go get them. I'd be stupid not to get the great deal that has been put in front of me. That is the basic psychology that we're dealing with here. I mean, hey, you guys know it. It, it is everywhere. It is what it is. Um, but uh, be aware of it. This is what to expect, though, when you're dealing with licensed, uh, you know, sort of licensed things, IP things. That being said, I've got to wonder, what is the crossover between Overwatch and Porsche? Yeah, because, and, and I've got to say, like, this is weird, because they went with the Porsche Mecca, right? Which is their cheaper SUV. And I mean, I'm thinking, right? Porsche, you got to take like a bit of an inspiration here. Or maybe Overwatch need to. Why are you pitching this at Mecan buyers when you could be going for like Taycan, GTS, fucking absolutely, you know, up to the tits, 250 grand crazy car. Um, So yes, with this upcoming Porsche uh, Overwatch collaboration, I mean, I cannot wait to see how much player value they're able to deliver with their skin offering. Don't know about you guys, but uh, I really uh, I'm quite excited. Do you know, I think it's really weird. Like, I, I really do like the classic Porsche shape. I think all those cars, you know, they're too big these days. But why are all of the Porsche design collab things that, like, happen with, with games, with laptops, with Razor, even with the Razor Blade, why do they all look terrible? I don't get it. Anyway, anyway, yes, um, if you somehow are in the Venn diagram of Diva and performance German cars, then there you go. They even have one for you. That's quite amazing. Uh, but it's not as amazing as a lot of the other things that we've uh, we've got to talk about, such as the very uh, fun things that X overwatch team members have said to the press. But before that, just to sort of wrap up our updates for Overwatch 2, who is Overwatch 4? Basically, it's for PvP players who are starting to get to grips with all of these changes. Obviously, with Season 9, we've had changes, and they are very much going to be focusing on iterating on PvP, making it better and better and better. That's basically the deal. Now, I'm going to take a quick little thing to say about sort of what my opinion is here. As a gamer, I like Overwatch 2. Back in 2016, whenever I first played the beta, I think it was 16, man, it felt slick. Like, that, that engine felt damn good. And even recently, when Overwatch 2 came out, look, I can play Baptiste because I'm a Halo player. You give me a, th you know, you give me a burst rifle, 
I'm ready to go. I really enjoyed that. I haven't played season nine yet, but I have um, just finished building my PC because the old one was broken so I can actually play Overwatch. And certainly, you know, high refresh rate monitor, playing some Overwatch 2, for me, pretty comfy good time. I'll enjoy that. Am I going to be buying loads of skins? No. And am I going to be, like, that's me enjoying a game made by game designers, but it's not me enjoying a whole branded experience. The thing about Overwatch, people loved its characters. There are so many games where you just have characters that are dime a dozen, you know? I mean, hey, you log into Randy Pitchford's Battleborn, you go to play some of Cliffy B's Lawbreakers and you see all the characters and then you're like, who the hell are these flipping jabronis? What's going on? Who who are they like that was the thing that overwatch always had a little bit different and had those really good character designs and it always teased people like i want more of this world i want the art book uh if you write a novel in the overwatch world i want to buy the novel i want to buy the comic book i want to buy you know consume 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 but not pvp gameplay that was world world that was being teased right um i mean come on we all know on a certain uh shall we say hubbed website uh the the humongous popularity of Overwatch character designs. I say that partially because it's funny, but also because, I mean, look, whenever people start doing NSFW stuff of your game, you know you've kind of made it. Uh, and suffice to say, that's why um, the team really did enjoy it when we uh, stumbled upon some interesting uh, artwork made for uh, for our game by, by fans, uh, the Pill Beyond. Um, yes, there was boning, but anyway. The thing with Overwatch 2 is right now it's a fun PvP game, but that's it. It's not a cultural experience, and that basically is where they have lost. Uh, and I think as they are losing in Overwatch as a cultural experience, there are other sort of games that are doing a better job uh, on that sort of cultural dimension. Um, obviously, with the likes of Arcane really building up Runeterra. Yeah, I don't know. I just think Blizzard are taking quite an L here. But to get into that, well, the play menu's been updated. Hero Mastery is now bigger than PvE story missions. People saw this and they thought, hmm, I wonder if this will be an indication of future trends uh yeah oh yeah it's gonna be so let's talk about the other side of things a bit of a sticking point with many people is um what about that game jeff uh big jeff promised us a few years ago where is it because it turns out they really don't have any intention intention of shipping it so here's what happened several x staff spoke to kenneth shepherd who was writing uh, on a piece for kotaku and those staff detailed what's going on with the content the original plans how things have changed and these staff broadly do not think that story missions are the future for the game and here we just really have some fascinating quotes and i was really left with one impression you know like a big fancy tasting menu you know you kind of get like nine little courses imagine if there was like a three hour gap between every single course and halfway through your big expensive tasting meal, you nipped out to McDonald's for like a big bunch of nuggies. That, that's kind of what the feel here is, is here because they were told, the team, that the intent was three missions every 18 months. Three missions every 18 months. Are you goddamn serious? What is going on? Oh, yeah. Trip fed. So three missions every 18 months. And to continue quoting from uh, this piece, they add that while the entire campaign may not be ready to ship yet, every mission is reportedly in some degree of completion at Blizzard. According to the same source, those levels range from fully playable to still in concept. So 18 months for three missions, that is going to take a very long time. I mean, to get, say, like a 12 mission campaign and certainly thinking like those missions, you know, they were taking, well, they weren't super long, right? Uh, but you're basically dealing with with six years, which, uh, funny enough, seems to be uh, how long it takes to make a big AAA game. Now, does that say something about the efficiencies of modern game development? Uh, because this is where things get really interesting, and I think about some of our internal postmortems that we've, um, you know, that we've had with our experience making the game, and it's one of those things. Man, I think these big companies can learn a lot from what us indies are forced to do, because we're on a knife edge, and if we fuck up, we're gone. We have no, you know, there's no nothing for anyone. Whereas, as we're going to find out, um, in the same way that Bioware would always say, it's fine, we have Bioware magic. Blizzard would always say Blizzard quality. And of course, Blizzard quality for a lot of us meant Warcraft 3 is amazing. We loved playing that. What it means when you scale it up here is a lot worse. Time for another quote. Blizzard quality is a justification to essentially piss around forever and ever redoing the same work over and over, the source said. Some executive goes, hmm, but is it Blizzard quality? It's always leadership or game directors deciding they need to spend extra time, so honestly, if they could have just made any kind of decisions, the game would have shipped years ago. And that's basically one of the big things here. A lot of the time, you do need completion pressure. In the worst case, that, that can obviously be quite bad. We do not want buggy releases. 
We want things to be, you know, to come out when they are done. But artists will kind of understand this. Sometimes when you're, you know, doing a piece, it's it's just, it works, right? You know, the stars align and it's fantastic. But there's other times, you know, you'll see an artist maybe be sitting there and they're just trying on a piece for days and days and days. And eventually they just end up with this Photoshop document that you would sort of call overworked. So it's the idea of um, you're just sitting there making a broth and that motherfucker is simmering for years as you just try to get it right before you serve anything. And, and I'm sure it's kind of similar with your job. Sometimes you end up just fiddling around trying to get something right to the point where actually turning over a new leaf and doing it again would probably even be faster. So that's basically an interesting thing for me. And to continue on, it does seem that things were uh, continually rough for the devs. Quote, you have designers, programmers, artists, QA, all disciplines on the team consistently making suggestions and ideas uh, to improve or trying to do the best we could. But it was all either shot down by a few gatekeepers or just people would say there was no point. There was no time they told Kotaku. Almost every single team town hall, there were questions about what do we do if it doesn't succeed? I don't feel confident that it will perform well. Um, what are we going to do when players are disappointed? It was met with either, don't worry about it, it'll be fine. We have so much confidence in it. Trust us. Um, yeah, that's that's quite something. I mean, once more, wh why am I seeing apparently game directors and game executives having a TikTok manifestation uh, people levels of it is fine. We will will success into the future with our minds. <laughs> Not good. And it's one of those things. Maintaining Blizzard quality is a really great ideal, but in a way that quality only matters if it ends up being a shipped game. To be honest, when I look at this, I see my own shorthand that I use is Schlieffen plans, uh, which is to say, um, I think we're in around the, the First World War, there's basically this, this German dude, right? And he was like, hey, this is our amazing plan to win. And people would call it a plan for victory. Obviously, no plan, as they say, survives contact with the enemy. And the sort of idea was that that plan was, uh, you know, had it just baked into it, all of these unrealistic assumptions about everything going well. Obviously, things didn't. As I would sort of apply that to maybe a sort of a game development side of things, trying to apply those sorts of lessons, you go to how they were told that they were shipping their missions in say packs of three but they were actually continually working you know on like all of the missions and that actually it may, may make sense and sure you want to have a layout of what you're doing but the thing is those other nine missions they don't matter if the first three aren't great what you should probably do is try to focus on making those three the best they can possibly be and really just deprioritize all of the other stuff it's one of those things where as uh, as somebody in more of a you could say a leadership position in game Games, and it's absolutely my largest personal pitfall in the past. It's very easy to say, okay, here's a bunch of game systems. Here's the entire big broad format of the game. This is what we're going to do. This is the big plan. But ultimately, what are you going to do when you get into work next week? You're going to be working in a small bit. And when it came to, say, getting The Pale Beyond into existence or some of our, um, you know, our current projects, um, what actually ended up working a lot better is, uh, okay, let's take a sort of slice um, of our game, actually start to generate hypotheses, test hypotheses, you know, learn things, fold that back into the dough. And it's one of those things where as you really focus in on that process, what kind of happens is you, you learn more and you increase your confidence in your ability to hit your next milestone. And it just seems to me like Blizzard is has been quite a big lumbering mess. And you have these kind of game, you know, these very directorial staff who ultimately are managing teams of like 400 people. So evidently, I mean, just a lot of work is going absolutely nowhere. At the end of the day, like I think we all know that the output that a lot of these teams have is not commensurate with their size or budget, like compared to what other studios are able to do. There just seems to be something about the live service game grind and the, you know, grand, grand plan for victory style of game that uh, at this very, very large AAA scale does not work. And it must be so goddamn expensive that that's why they have to be so ridiculous with the microtransactions. I mean, recently, I, I think I titled a video, you know, Blizzard cannot compete. It was about the last epoch, right? Last epoch, the action RPG. And my point in the title of that video was last epoch is not made by a company as big as blizzard not made by a team as big as blizzard probably you know who, who knows about like staff pay or that sort of thing but also last epoch is made by the last epoch team and the last epoch company whereas overwatch was made by a team within blizzard who are expected to be a net beneficiary to 
the Activision Blizzard, you know, overall financial performance. There's a very big difference there that means that where Last Epoch can, for every $100 they spend on development, I think they can get a hell of a lot more than Blizzard can. And that's maybe why we as players, we see these large, large, absolutely goddamn humongous companies, and then we think to ourselves, how the hell are they making so little shit? And I think if you actually ask the people who are working in these teams, they can tell you. One source basically said, they talked about rationale and they said this, quote, it really doesn't seem like even from a business perspective that Activision or Microsoft have any faith in PVE. And basically the problem here is that they kind of turn story missions into a sort of referendum for their own existence with the invasion pack. Remember, it was 15 bucks, but really because of the cosmetic bundle and uh, the Overwatch coins bundle, they really wanted you to spend 40 bucks on that. Well, that was basically saying, will the audience, uh, you know, will the audience do that? And we actually know about that performance at least per one source. One source said Activision Blizzard wanted the first batch of missions to do serious numbers to justify completing the campaign. Another said those missions, quote, did not sell well at all, both financially or in terms of player sentiment. What takes more time? making three big missions or making four cowboy beatbop skins and selling them for $50? The answer, ladies and gentlemen, is the latter. And that is why we live in a very inshitified nightmare hellscape because in a world where a few artists making a skin when that can generate you know sort of ticket prices that are higher than three gameplay missions made to support a whole bunch of characters with a whole bunch of difficulty levels with a whole bunch of narrative design with a bunch of marketing with a bunch of maybe even you know um, transmedia narrative no wonder we're just being sold skins all the time i mean come on so basically with that it seems that pve stocks are way 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 down which absolutely sucks i mean even recently there was a pve event and um, on the live show that i do with matt in our warcraft channel we looked at a at a tweet where this uh, you know that's uh she, she was basically talking about how she was proud of the team. And uh, her final thing was, oh yeah, by the way, that team, like those people don't work at Blizzard anymore because they were hit by the layoffs. And we do know that the Overwatch PVE side of things was hit really hard by those layoffs. So basically it is going to be PvP all the time. Now, sources uh, told Kotaku that PvP and competitive was always the focus. PvE was always taking the back seat. And the framing here is that the game leads, I mean, this is kind of crazy, and um, it's really framed by the sources as a scapegoating thing. Here's a quote. They used to say all the time that we would essentially need two 400 people teams, one for PvP and one for PvE to have the personnel needed, a source said. And they go on to say, quote, I don't think that's true. There were already too many cooks. And I think that absolutely is the case. There are some things like parts of an art pipeline can scale quite healthfully as you increase team size. Other things, they do not scale like that. They do not even scale linearly. So really, I think a lot of this stuff, and then when you add in blizzard quality stuff as almost a scapegoat i think there's just so many negative self-fulfilling prophecies here management you know they won't let staff deliver at a rate that they're capable of so they then scope the project based on staff capacities that's kind of wildly undervaluing what an individual can do but probably overvaluing what a you know what a team can do perhaps um this maybe requires a lot of their cost estimates and stuff like that to balloon to the point where apparently to do pve properly you actually need an entire other major triple a studio sized team working in something uh, it all just seems absolutely crazy and that ultimately is the state of overwatch 2 right now gone i think is the broader vision of overwatch as a universe that we want to spend time in now it is a hero shooter pvp that i think can be a marvelously fun game that has lost cultural relevance and uh, i think will not uh, whatsoever live up to its potential because that ship sailed they got to overwatch too late but it's not that they were like you know late and a dollar short they they were late and basically completely skint and uh, naked they, they they did not have what they needed it's sad that being said they have made positive changes with this next season. I can say that overall, as a, as a pundit in this space, I would say Overwatch, big picture, absolute goddamn disaster, and that's really sad. 
I will say personally, as somebody who likes PvP shooter games, the idea of playing this is still a, a fun thing to me. I'm not going to be culturally deeply invested into it. I don't really care about the world. And when I played the invasion missions, they were fine, but they really didn't do anything to change that. I think it's quite sad if you look at the Overwatch, uh, you know, the cinematics, the cinematic that they, they tried to, uh, you know, reveal Overwatch 2 with, those always spoke to some sort of, uh, you know, grand, positive, ambitious, uh, you know, experience. And that's just never going to happen. And the problem is it means that that marketing just feels like lies. And that sucks. That's it for today. I hope that you found this to be uh, to be entertaining. I did decide to be a little bit more loosey-goosey in the time because, hey, it's kind of talking about Overwatch 2 drama. I think this is one where we can chew the fat and have some fun together. That's it then. There was a video yesterday. There will be one tomorrow. You know what the deal is. And of course, if you want to get content early, if you want to uh, check out loading screen and hang out with us over in the members lounge, uh, you can go to bellular.com games and we're uh, we're making improvements to the site all the time it's been really cool to see adam just shipping improvements like a little table of contents thing and stuff uh yeah it's all real fun anyway have an awesome day see you next time